Hello, I'm Chris Gabbard, and I'm from the University of North Florida. And the title of my talk today is That Secret Something, Invisible Mental Disability and the Trope of Exclusion. At the beginning of the 19th century, Jean-Marc Itard attempted to educate Victor, the wild boy of Avaron. Itard was unsuccessful with Victor, but due to his efforts, he is widely credited with founding the field of exceptional education. Itard's teaching of Victor is arguably the first recorded instance of someone working on an extended basis with a person with intellectual and or developmental disabilities, or IDD. But roughly 70 years earlier, a boy similar to Victor appeared on the scene, and this was Peter the Wild Boy. Daniel Defoe's 1726, Mere Nature Delineated, or A Body Without a Soul, is a hefty pamphlet about Peter. And the story goes thus. In 1725, a nonverbal homeless boy, given the name Peter, was found living on his own in the woods near Hanover in Germany. Brought to Britain by order of King George I, himself a Hanoverian, and then to the London court to Kensington Palace, Peter was a sensation, with one commentator noting that uh, his presence in England was, quote, more remarkable than the discovery of Uranus. Interest focused on Peter as exemplifying a feral human being who had been found in a much hypothesized state of nature. The supposedly wild human being discovered not in the Americas, but in the heart of Europe generated great excitement. In London, he was brought, as I said before, to Kensington Palace, and I'll give you a very brief tour. Uh, he is featured in one of the panels in the King's Stairwell. This is the panel on the right. Closer up of the panel, here's Peter in green. Next to Peter is Dr. John Arbuthnot. Arbuthnot was charged with attempting to teach Peter to speak, but unlike Itar with uh, uh, Victor the Wild Boy of Averon, uh, Arbuthnot gave up after about a week. Here's a close-up of Peter. Anyway, the story is about Defoe. And um, Defoe met with Peter uh, several times and in mere nature delineated, he is deeply skeptical of almost every aspect of the popular narrative about him. He doubts that he has uh, doubts that the a naked adolescent could survive even a week in the bitterly cold German forests. More importantly, he makes clear that Peter's mental processing flaws rendered him incapable of carrying out basic life sustaining activities. He believes that Peter's mental processing flaws are significantly compromised and unrepairable. One factor not contributing to Defoe's optimism was the fact that Peter neither noticed nor cared when he soiled himself. Defoe ultimately concludes that Peter is deficient in, quote, that secret something, end quote. The boy, in essence, is a, quote, body without a soul, end quote. In other words, Peter possesses human morphology, but lacks not only a thinking, rational intellect, but also an immortal soul. Defoe thus excludes Peter from membership in the human species on account of his mental disability. Moreover, throughout mere nature delineated, Defoe's assessment regarding Peter and his future is extremely and doggedly pessimistic. Still, a question remained. If Peter had not been a wild inhabitant of the woods, as Defoe suspects, from where did he come? Defoe intuits that he must have been discarded, characterizing him as, quote, this poor abandoned creature. Decades later, the German anthropologist Johann Friedrich Blumenbach produced evidence that the boy was, quote, a mute and retarded son of a widower named Kruger, who had been thrust out into the German woods by Kruger's second wife, end quote, to live on his own. If this is the case, Peter's story reverses the polarities of the changeling myth of folklore, for instead of a baby being switched, Peter's Kruger parents were swapped, replaced by a king and queen of England, this substitution turned out to be good luck for Peter, for it was his changeling father and mother who ultimately uh, ensured his well-being. After George I's death in 1727, Queen Caroline, wife of the succeeding George II, paid for Peter's care. In fact, Queen Caroline made a lifetime provision for him. Peter was sent to live on a farm in Hertfordshire and wound up in the care of one rural family and then another, each of whom received a large royal pension to provide for his upkeep. In 1782, the Scottish philosopher Lord Monbado visited Peter when he was probably 69 and, quote, found him fit and healthy, and still able to do manual work around the farm, end quote. Lucy Worsley, curator of historical royal palaces, states that Peter had, quote, ended up in good hands. The farmers were fond of him. He was a very gentle character. Peter died in 1785 at about the age 72. The locals paid for a headstone. 
He is buried in North Church, Hertfordshire. Defoe had expressed extreme pessimism in Mere Nature Delineated about the supposed wretchedness of Peter's coming life, but this negative outcome was not borne out. The upturn in Peter's fortunes had everything to do with the fact that society, through a king's and a queen's intervention, had accommodated his so-called special needs, providing caregivers, a social support system to help him carry out the functions necessary to maintain life. Defoe could not have foreseen that Peter's life would turn out relatively well due to royal intercession. He had only his encounter with a boy upon which to base his prediction and his awareness that no um, support system was in place. In other words, he had no way of knowing that Peter would benefit from random good luck. And ultimately, this is what made the difference for Peter, random good luck. As we know, random good luck is not the case for the majority of people with intellectual and uh, developmental disabilities. Random good luck was not the case for people with IDD at Willowbrook State School. It was not the case for Elijah McLean. It's been not the case for people with IDD in the United Kingdom during COVID who had DNRs automatically put into their hospital files. It was not the case for Sarah McSweeney. It's not the case for Michael Hickson. But it was the case for Peter. Every person with a significant intellectual and or developmental disability should be so fortunate as to have a king and a queen bring about a fairy tale ending, a lifetime of care. And these remarks uh, today are elaborated in defining the boundaries of disability critical perspectives. My chapter in it is titled Robinson Crusoe and Peter the Wild Boy, what Daniel Defoe inadvertently tells us about disability. Thank you for listening to my remarks today.